welcome everyone. I'm Jamie Monson. I'm the director of the African Studies Center here at Michigan State University. It's great to welcome everyone here to our Eye on Africa this week. And I'm really delighted that Cal Barrick is here to talk about her work and her new book, Cooking Data, Culture, and Politics in an African Research World. Her book just came out from Duke University Press in 2018, and she's also published numerous articles and already embarking on a new project called Fake Gaze, Metrics, Ethics, and Authenticity in African Aid Economies. So her work is very exciting. She brings together ethnographic work, queer theory, and demography and data studies. She tries to bring these insights together to show that numbers have meaning both on the ground and also in the abstract. And I love her concept of this mix of ethnography and survey research as something that can be traced in a sense like a life history. So data, like people apparently have life histories. I love that idea, of course, as a historian. Um, but looking at, at transformations of data from the time they're recorded <coughs> to the time that they get consumed by policymakers and public audiences like the one we have here today. It's wonderful to have you here, Cal. We're really delighted to have you with us. So warmly welcome. Thank you. So yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to uh, Liz, especially, and the African Studies Center for inviting me here today uh, to all of you for coming. So um, my talk will run about 50 minutes or, or less um, and, and takes form as a kind of montage of, of the recently published book, uh, the title of which appears here. Um, and the sort of deceptively simple question that motivated this book project and takes on, I think, crucial significance in a moment when data, both as rhetoric and as a tangible thing in the world, has immense value as the grounds or justification for a wide variety of sectors, um, is kind of what's in a number. And for most of us, um, data are useful instruments for measuring phenomena, determining how to solve problems, or working toward improvement, self or otherwise. Rarely, however, do we take pause to consider where data come from and how their modes of collection and circulation might inflect the claims they seek to make about people, places, and things. So um, my book, I hope, invites us to see data as socially produced and politically potent and um, also perhaps to adopt a critical stance or a kind of data literacy uh, that can help erode the mystique of data of, of all sorts. Um, so the data under discussion today are, are kind of a form of small rather than big data, which I think we hear a lot about these days. Um, and they're collected periodically by American and European-led demographic survey projects from rural Malawian households uh, in order to track changes over time in economic trends, agricultural yields, HIV prevalence, fertility, food security, um, and so on. So as an anthropologist among the demographers, I spent over one year immersed in everyday survey data collection uh, as an interested observer, and I'll talk more about the particulars of that in a moment. Um, I, I sort of took up positions on what demographers uh, kind of imagined to be an assembly line of data production that produces uh, kind of ideally identical widgets. Um, but I'll show today how um, this kind of assembly line actually looks more like a life course where any single datum results from unfolding transactions and relations. So projects like the, ones, like the ones I'm discussing are recognizable as part of the 20th century rise of infrastructures of family planning, development, global health, and NGO efforts to govern the categories broadly of population and economy. Um, as Michelle Murphy suggests, they enact a biopolitics that is an alibi for nurturing or disinvesting from certain issues, say gender equality, from certain groups of people, um, say men who have sex with men, and certain topics, AIDS, um, and of course the infrastructures that support these areas of inquiry uh, or intervention. So, for example, data or units of information uh, collected by field workers for projects like the ones I'll be discussing might go on to become evidence for where resources should or should not be directed, and of course take form in uh, demography journals or might be presented to policymakers um, as the grounds or justification for certain projects. Um, I, I portray here the first page of um, the 25-page survey that was administered in 2008 by a project I'll refer to as LSAM, the Longitudinal Study of AIDS in Malawi. One 
one of the longest running panel surveys uh, in an African country dating from 1994. Um, so you can see here in the aesthetics, the sort of neat boxes and, and open spaces that invite uh, a Malawian field worker to fill them in. Um, and here below we can see something like uh, the, the life course of data. So at every stage, this survey um, needs to be initialed and checked. There's kind of um, checks and balances built into the system to verify the quality, the completeness, the comprehensiveness, um, and sort of the fact that data is generally error-free or internally consistent. Um, and uh, here's just another example. This is a typical kind of household roster. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and a field worker here would be expected um, to document all of the members of a particular household um, listed there all the way on the left and ask a long series of questions about each of those people matching particular codes. So for example, um, did so-and-so sleep here last night? No equals zero, yes equals one. So just to give you a sense of some of the um, tangible aesthetics of the, the survey pages, um, An extensive literature authored by statisticians and survey researchers aims to diagnose, document, uh, and mitigate instances of what is called cooking or data fabrication by data collectors, who since the colonial period are typically cast as liabilities to good data. Um, and of course, much of that being a racialized discourse dating from the earliest uh, periods um, of data collection on the continent. Um, however, accounts of data practices in the field take for granted a fundamental difference between raw and cooked data, and this is the binary that my book sort of tries to destabilize. Um, anthropology and demography, of course, are, are very different disciplines and pre, um, sort of presume very different orientations to numbers, um, as Carolyn Bledsoe's work on fertility surveys in the Gambia has so well shown. Yet, I want to make clear that cooking data uh, does not argue that the data produced by projects like these um, is fabricated or falsified. I don't argue that demographers fail. In fact, um, I argue that they see exactly what they, they mean to see. Um, and the book really doesn't um, seek to reveal what numbers miss out on, though that does come up throughout the book. Um, there's a lot of other work that does that really well. Um, and I also don't really aim to provide advice to researchers about how to mitigate cooking. Instead, I really try to show that all data, even that that's verified as clean or presumed to be raw, is cooked in processes and practices of production. So um, I'm talking here about kind of an, an ethnography of numbers is, is how I would sort of uh, orient my method um, that I, I took up in, in looking at some of these questions. Um, so a sort of a brief interlude on um, how I went about this work. So I actually spent time with four different um, kind of longitudinal, uh, in two cases, and um, survey projects broadly interpreted across all of the projects. The ones I'll be discussing today and that take the most prominent position in the book in general um, are two projects, uh, one, Marriage, AIDS, and Young People, MAPE, the acronym, uh, and Longitudinal Study of AIDS in Malawi, LSAM. These are uh, anonymized in line with my IRB, although um, all the projects were quite fine with not being anonymized. Um, and uh, the sample sizes here range uh, in these two cases from about 1,200 to about 4,000. Um, and of course, these are longitudinal projects. So these are samples that are used um, in future cases to answer other questions. So this is like a database that can be used to and drawn on to answer various questions that have yet not been asked, so to speak. Um, and uh, the, the pace and timing of my work was interesting. So most of us imagine ethnography and anthropology as this you know, lone Malinowski-like figure of um, you know, the singular anthropologist spending um, you know, over one year or two years right, in a village that they somehow claim as their own. Um, that was really not the nature of my work. And in fact, my work was um, inflected by the tempos of demographic work, which is usually by field season. So um, most projects, uh, that, like the ones I'm discussing, will come to Malawi or elsewhere for a period of, say, two to five months um, in order to collect data from their respondents. So um, I was initially going to spend time with one project, and I quickly found it might be more efficient and useful to spend time with four projects, all of whom were in the field um, for different portions of the two years that I was like in Malawi. Um, so today I'll be discussing these two projects. They kind of have in common that they all administered. Both of them administered um, a questionnaire, um, like the one I was just depicting. Um, and in the case of LSAM, they also administered an HIV test at the time. Um, this was a cheek swab test, and um, that uh, it had been in prior years a blood test. Um, and uh, not all of the sampled people received the HIV test, a smaller sub subset of the sample did. 
Um, and uh, so, so yeah, these were the projects. I'm going to be talking about, um, and the book talks a lot about, um, what others working broadly in the field of African <laughs> studies, anthropology, and history have called middlemen. So these are figures um, that others discuss, like interpreters, translators, civil servants. Um, Nancy Jacobs talks recently about vernacular birders who were central to the production of ornithological knowledge uh, in Africa. And so um, my sort of intermediaries or middlemen are field workers. And um, I sort of give a brief summary of uh, the figures I'll discuss today. Field work supervisors were largely college educated. Um, some even had master's degrees. They oversaw everyday data collection and sort of uh, were responsible for checking the quality of the surveys as they, before they went into the office and to be entered into databases. Data collectors were largely, um, they had finished secondary school in most cases. Um, and uh, they uh, sort of found work in a contractual basis. Um, when projects were passing through, um, they might be hired by one project and then another project. The work, of course, being temporary and um, following, again, the tempos of research. So the, all of the field workers described here really described kind of their um, livelihood as living project to project. So there would be gaps in their employment when projects weren't collecting data. And um, of course, this is largely framed as kind of unskilled labor. Um, they're quite uh, low paid, as you might imagine. Um, at the time of this work, I believe the, the data collectors were paid around uh, 10 or 11 dollars a day. This was in 2008. Um, so uh, nonetheless, this became a really important source of livelihood amid large, uh, or large uh, unemployment in, in Malawi, of course. Okay. Um, so my talk today, like my book, foregrounds data's materiality and social lives as they progress through their life course, bookended by survey design, what we might call the birth of a survey, and the dissemination of findings drawn from data. So the chapters of the book loosely follow this arc from survey design and translation, to training field workers, to ensuring data collection meets ethical standards, to survey administration in the field, and finally to presentation of findings at conferences or in policy forums. So its emphasis is on showing how a particular set of epistemic criteria creates the human and social scaffolding for the implementation and to what ends. So the talk today has three sections. First, I'll elaborate briefly on the title of the book, Cooking Data, um, explaining why I chose this as the organizing analytic for the book. Uh, then I'll share fragments from three chapters of the book. And um, I like telling stories with objects, so I actually bought some props. Um, one of the things I'll talk about today is soap. Okay, and you'll see how this all fits together at the end, I hope. Another is um, beans. Okay, they're, they're in a dish. Um, and then the last is chitenje, um, or fabric, okay. Um, so each of these seemingly minor objects, uh, you know, that feature in the book um, helps reveal how data collection or something about how data collection happens in a socio-technical infrastructure um, that variously enhances and disrupts the epistemic standards and blueprints or recipes implemented by demographers. So um, the middle three sections of the talk think about how data do more than merely count or miscount get things wrong or right. They also assemble specific kinds of relations and transactions around them. They make social worlds and people as much as they measure them. So I'll conclude by gesturing toward what ethnography of numbers might contribute to critical data studies more broadly, and particularly amid the rise of big data. So cooking data. Um, in 1948, C.J. Martin, director of the East African Statistical Department, speculated that African data collectors for the census in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania <laughs> might invent the data they were meant to record. He suggested, quote, it was necessary to be sure the African chosen would undertake his work efficiently and successfully, as with a period of only a few days to be employed, he might be tempted to sit under a banana tree and write the first figures which came into his head um, onto the forms. In mid-June 2008, six years later, I sat with a team of Malawian data collectors in a minibus parked in a village in central Malawi where they were administering household-level surveys for an American-led project, um, which I call LSAM. They'd finished their work for the day and were conversing about one of their colleagues as he sat under a tree nearby, pencil in hand and head bent over a survey questionnaire, much like we see in the photo here. As he checked the questionnaire to ensure that each question had been answered by his recent respondent, those in the van jokingly accused him of cooking data using um, the Chewa term for cooking that would be used to describe cooking in the kitchen. Soon after, uh, kupi gamadata, soon after the minibus hurried back to the field office nearby where the questionnaires were deposited in cardboard boxes to be entered into a database. Cooking data, as you may infer or be familiar, refers to fabricating, falsifying, or fudging information one is meant to collect in a standardized and clean manner. 
So Martin's fears that enumerators would write the first figures which came into their heads onto their forms reflect his stakes in the endeavor to accurately map African populations in the territories his office oversaw, express racialized hierarchies of suspicion that continue to permeate research cultures today, and illustrate how data collectors' practices in the field might spoil census data that would later be analyzed in the office, i.e. raw data would be ruined, that is transformed in the wrong way. So this suspicion, of course, um, invisibilizes how the assumptions and ways of seeing that prefigure what constitutes data in the first place, even before it is collected, are likewise a sort of form of cooking and also obscure how the labor of data cleaning and scrubbing, so removing corrupt data um, or fixing errors in data sets later on, um, packages data for consumption. So meanwhile, in 2008, the phrase cooking data operated among Malawian field workers as playful commentary on colleagues' work performance, indicating they had come to articulate and embody the habits, investments, and standards central to the collection of high-quality data imparted to them by American demographers during very intensive pre-field work training sessions. The accounts point to tensions between standardization and improvisation, and concerns about data quality that are at the core of my book, and continue to preoccupy those who administer surveys in Africa today, um, and for that matter, elsewhere. Talk of raw and cooked data recall Levi Strauss's classic study in which he argues that the interplay between the categories raw and cooked um, is the building block of myths found across many cultures that enable reflection on the core natural and cultural. Um, cooking is in essence, very simply put, the cultural transformation of the raw. Playing on this culinary metaphor wherein raw data must be properly cooked but not overcooked to be palatable to demographers, I show how cultural tinkering and negotiations, forms of cooking largely invisible to those who uh, consume numbers, are central to the production of quantitative health data in its life course. So in what follows, I move outside of the office uh, into what demographers and data collection teams refer to as the field. And I should note that this term and their reference to it carried pretty much the same connotations that it carries in the discipline of anthropology as well. Um, so uh, one of the main efforts of my book is to shift our gaze away from illustrious global health scientists toward more minor actors. Um, here, um, so-called unskilled data collectors um, and who are often framed as interchangeable cogs in a larger machine of knowledge production. And of course, since the colonial era rise, particularly the rise of tropical medicine um, as a, a field of inquiry. Um, standards of data collection I show make stability and fixity in numerical representation possible, not despite, but because of their customization by field workers in the field. So first I'll discuss um, Zitenje, so you'll hear how it plays into the story I'm trying to tell. Um, brokering and translation on the part of hundreds of field workers, my book shows, are central ingredients in data collection and add value to data. The commodification of data for consumption by researchers and policymakers has likewise commodified the kinds of expertise and know-how central to its collection. In the book, I show how this process has enabled Malawian secondary and college graduates to find temporary contractual employment in the world of global health research, affording them in some cases measures of economic and social mobility through what they term living project to project. Local knowledge, which is often taken for granted by researchers, is performed and constructed in the space of social relations, and such performances betray the different competing interests of the variety of persons who encounter one another in uh, what Pratt would call the contact zone of fieldwork. The uncoupling of authorship from data, uh, of data from a single sovereign researcher enables both possibilities and pitfalls for the kinds of knowledge that get produced. So this excerpt from a training manual which was distributed to fieldwork teams by ELSAM, authored by veteran Malawian fieldworkers, um, rhetorically places a boundary between the voluntary counseling and testing counselors and their subjects, rural Malawians, by confining culture to the villages, framing culture as timeless and stagnant, and associating the power to change culture with uh, the HIV test counselors. And I retain in the book the, the acronym VCT because HTC came about um, <coughs> much, much later on, uh, so I just... Uh, uh, call it VCT. Likewise, in its objective to train or teach the counselors to be good field workers, it draws a boundary between the project and its employees, solidifying and emphasizing boundaries between themselves and their employers and between themselves and rural research participants enables supervisors and interviewers to preserve ownership over local knowledge and ensure it remains valuable. Within a survey project, it is not just data that are produced, but identities, dreams, and hierarchies as well. 
So the projects I spent time with all held um, extremely intensive uh, training sessions for field workers during the first week or two uh, of a field work season. So these trainings took place in rented facilities, often a teacher's college or um, a small lodge in a rural area, um, or at the guest house where field, field work teams would stay nearby to sample villages uh, for the period of data collection. Their purpose was to encourage bonding among field teams to determine before field work began which field workers should be let go or would not be unable to do the work, to familiarize field workers with the survey or other instruments to be implemented, and of course to standardize and harmonize data collection procedures as much as possible. And this was literally at the level of individual instrument or question, so we would go through systematically every single question on the survey and talk about whether people should put leading zeros, whether they should um, put a slash mark or a zero or um, those kinds of things. But Becoming a competent field worker necessitates training as a mode of professionalization into the world of survey research. Field workers are trained to transform villages into the field, snippets of conversation into data, and rural dwellers into respondents. Instead of initiating field workers into local culture, these trainings initiate them into research culture, and in the process facilitate new imaginings of self and other. Data collection is an endeavor that produces new kinds of social boundaries and forms of difference and revalues local knowledge. In fact, as I show in the book, it is their interactions with data and standards for its collection that field workers gain the local expertise they often <coughs> offer to uh, foreign researchers, um, such that I think this destabilizes some conceptions of local knowledge as, as either somehow inherently right, part of the local or um, as something that uh, is sort of cannibalized by outside projects. So. Um, um, I, I sort of show how lo the entity of local knowledge is produced uh, in the, the research culture context. Um, participants in training sessions co-constructed an archetypal villager or research subject um, imagined to facilitate their work in the field. Engagement with this ideal type villager necessitated preparations and forethought as to proper comportment, behavior, and dress code on the part of teams. On day two of a joint training session for LSAM interviewers and HIV counselors in May 2008, Francis, the Malawian team supervisor, provided a rapid fire set of guidelines to his trainees. Quote, how do we dress for the field? We put on chitenje. We can't wear what we wear in the city. You have to suit the environment. Strong perfume makes respondents uncomfortable. Manners affect everything. Do not chew gum. Don't appear to be gossiping in front of villagers, unquote. The supervisor closed this session with a performance of a commonly known piece of village culture in Malawi. He clasped his hands together and thanked the trainees for their attention, saying zikomo or thank you. So this gesture, zikomo, was explained for the benefit of those who may have been unfamiliar. Um, Francis said, quote, always do this if you pass someone in the village or if you wish to enter someone's compound. Simple instructions such as these belied an assumption on the part of LSAM's Malawian supervisors that field workers must be familiarized with or acclimated to the field. And this was interesting uh, in, the, in, in the sense that in LSAM's case, some data collectors were actually hired locally. Um, so they were from the same rural areas um, and sometimes even found to be in the random sample as survey respondents themselves. Um, so as they are trained to embody a new occupational role, they're also taught they're fundamentally different, more urbane, more familiar with international branding, more sophisticated more open-minded um, than villagers they will be interviewing. However, Francis's instructions also point to the supervisor's interest in maintaining a boundary between themselves and their trainees. So they are the experts imparting accumulated fieldwork wisdom to a group of initiates. Project guidelines for dress and comportment were meticulously observed by field workers and monitored by field work supervisors, and clothing and action became embodied symbols of field workers' professionalism, status, and difference from rural villagers. In June 2008, I attended training sessions for LSAM interviewers who'd be administering the 25 page survey to villagers in the coming weeks. As they prepared to enter the field for the first time to pilot the survey, a supervisor singled out a fashionably dressed male interviewer who was sporting a cap to drive home a lesson. We can't be putting on hats like this one, Kumutsi, or in the village. A few months later, another male interviewer was sent home to change his trouser, trousers before work. His supervisor asked him, what were you thinking coming to work with those jeans with 50 cent written on them in big letters? And <laughs> 50 cent being an American hip hop artist, in case you're unfamiliar. Um, interviewers too commented on colleagues hair, often in gendered fashion, as when one woman was consistently singled out for choosing to wear shoes meant for clubbing in the field. Critiques of field attire such as these produced the city and the village as incommensurable. Um, and this was driven home with phrases like Blantyre is Blantyre, but Mchinji uh, is another thing altogether. Blantyre, of course, being um, Malawi's commercial, one of Malawi's commercial cities. In their effort to blend in with villagers, field workers employed costumes, props, and accessories 
During our daily minibus journeys to the field, I witnessed a ritualized collapse and maintenance of boundaries between the categories field and office and researched and researcher. At about the halfway point between the field office and the field in the mornings, the women in the van tied headscarves or bandanas around their heads and knotted colorful chitenje fabric around their waist, usually over trousers or a skirt. At the end of the day, they sighed with relief, unwrapped their heads, and removed the now dusty chitenje. Men, too, adopted certain ritualized codes of dress and mannerisms. They referred to their older, less fashionable sneakers as fieldwork shoes and replaced them with their regular, cleaner, and more stylish shoes at the end of the day before we headed into the local trading center for dinner. During downtime in the field, supervisors often shopped at weekly markets and trading centers near sample villages for low-priced kaunjika or field clothes, um, kaunjika being used clothing. The symbolic distance between the field workers and villagers was re-established as the minivan hurried back to the field office in the evenings. So rituals of fieldwork dress were at the center of a discussion between Dr. Smith, an American public health researcher in Malawi for two weeks, and John, the supervisor for the project's data collection that summer. Um, Malawi's winter. Dr. Smith inquired why female field workers wore headscarves while in the field but not in the office. John explained it was to foster closeness to respondents by hiding things like expensive extensions or elaborate hairstyles village women do not have access to. To not wear the scarf would be saying, I have a lot of money and I'm not from around here and I care too much about my hair, he said. In practice, however, wearing scarves and satenje worked to accentuate the social distance between interviewers and research subjects. Respondents could tell if a field worker wore her hair and extensions, even if she covered them with a headscarf and knew she was dressing down. <laughs> however, attempting to blend in allowed the interviewer to maintain a foothold in both the local and research worlds she straddled. Interviewers critically uh, became skilled at using cultural diacritics to competently blend into the field and embody a certain cultural field style, following Ferguson, by deploying signs in a way that positions them in relation to social categories. So even if they were not fooling anyone, dressing and undressing indicated their interest in mastering the local and endeavor at the center of professionalization into fieldwork. So clothes and accessories may seem insignificant props in the drama of fieldwork, but they're symbolic markers of the investments of members of fieldwork cultures in policing a boundary between field and office and knowers and known. It is the shared agenda of the actors who make up the survey research project, producing high quality data that gives birth to new social hierarchies and status regimes mirrored by the spatialized narrative and performance of difference. So indeed, the field itself, central knowledge of, unit of knowledge production, needed rhetorical containerizing to be manageable and masterable. So the field was also produced as a place of difference and field workers' narrations of field work as an adventure, as out of the ordinary or a kind of roughing it, here in resonance, of course, with the stories you've probably heard anthropologists themselves tell. Supervisors who tended to be from the cities and college educated enjoyed field work because it afforded them the opportunity to, in their words, discover the real Malawi and like that it provided opportunities to make business or other connections, to see family in other parts of Malawi and to eat what they termed new and different foods. Some projects took field workers on short leisure trips, uh, like wildlife reserves near research sites, and all projects organized parties with a braai, DJ, and dancing for employees at the end of data collection. So field workers appreciated the intimate fictive kinship that developed in research cultures and very often referred to their workmates as a kind of field work family. Field workers mentioned they like learning what rural Malawians do, being exposed to the cultural beliefs of rural people, learning about real Chewa culture, and uh, Chewa here being almost synonymous with Malawian considering um, post-independent uh, President Hastings Kamuzu Banda's project of kind of Chewa-nization. Um, they liked playing bow, a traditional game of skill, or football with young men in trading centers and listening to elder stories in the villages. So field workers and anthropologists come to see the field as something outside their everyday worlds that must be embodied through discipline, training, and experience. Interviewers working in their own districts or villages um, emphasize this difference in order to lend credibility to their new role as expert interviewers and draw attention to their belonging in a community of researchers. So this role and its associated symbols, some of them seen here, a project t-shirt, a badge, clipboard, canvas bag for holding soap and surveys, confirmed them significant status and cultural capital among their peers um, and measures of respectability. Um, often some of these uh, in cases where projects were hired locally were acquaintances or family members, of course. Through their initiation into research culture, individuals learned to see research participants as different, even as they mastered a set of techniques to commensurate themselves with this place called the field. 
Training sessions produced expectations and stereotypes about village culture, which were meant to guide the actions of field workers on the job. So the manual and training sessions objectified culture as a stumbling block to the progress of research in the field. Everyone is molded by culture and defends his culture, and it is not easy to change one's culture just by comparing to some culture practiced by some people everywhere, uh, somewhere. Us as counselors are not supposed to advise, but rather give information, have a small mouth, um, like hold one's tongue, and avoid developing anger or creating bad feelings with the people you are working with. Um, interviewers at another training session were encouraged to try not to change whatever villagers believe or tell them it is wrong to believe in witches. So these sessions and the talk and rhetoric common to research worlds make culture visible to field workers by inventing it and containing it in the field, facilitating their imagination that they are links or translators between two worlds glossed as the field in the office. And of course, this recalls Roy Wagner's famous argument that anthropologists invent culture as an object of study upon entering into the field. So trainings ask interviewers to black box culture in order to render it incapable of slowing down field work. This black boxing plays a central role in what I call seeing like a research project, where the sample is standardized and a bounded unit that acts as a container for data. In inventing culture as something other, field workers and supervisors shore up their performances of objectivity, neutrality, and professionalism. And data collection is framed as a scientific rather than a cultural uh, enterprise. African researchers and informants have long played a central role in making African societies accessible logistically and culturally to uh, outsiders. Northern researchers reinterpret Malawian ideas, traditions, customs, behaviors, and context through the prism of their training in a certain discipline and also scripted impressions of Malawi. Most influentially, however, they complement these perceptions with local knowledge they so highly value taken from uh, African research assistants. Yet becoming a good field worker does not entail mastering a body of stable local knowledge or being native to a geographic or cultural place, but rather learning and embodying new ways of seeing that rely on and reproduce difference and distance between knowers and known, science and culture, and the field and the office. Um, so data collection is an endeavor shaped by and shaping of the subjectivities, aspirations, and dreams of those who collect it. Um, so I'll move now to kind of my second object, which is SOAP. Um, so the justification for research in impoverished settings relies on a presumption that it will improve the collective good or bring abstract future benefits to participants. But participants, as we will see, often expect their lives in the present to be transformed. So the project discussed in my book did not provide medicine or treatment. They were not biomedical-centered uh, projects, nor did they build schools or hospitals. Um, they did, however, give respondents to survey questionnaires uh, a bar of soap. Um, they actually gave two bars of soap, a bar of sunlight and a bar of life boy. Um, and this was framed as a gift of thanks for, for their time. Um, and in the book, of course, I elaborate on the long legacies of this form of colonial debris par excellence, drawing on the work of Emma McClintock and Timothy Burke. Um, from the perspective of demographers who designed surveys and oversaw their implementation in the field and the Malawian ethics boards, um, who reviewed research proposals, soap was an ideal and clean gift. So ubiquitous and with small monetary value, soap does not threaten to induce participation or to invalidate consent, um, which is of course the gold standard of human subjects research. So it doesn't threaten to induce or incentivize participation um, as money would, and this despite um, the, the complaints um, and registers of complaint from participants that they would prefer to receive money, of course, or they would pr prefer to receive um, actually Kaunjika or Chitenje or something like this. Um, it is less heavy to carry in field workers' canvas bags than um, the one kilogram of sugar that had been given in the past and, and deemed to be healthier as well. Um, soap is an accomplice in informed consent's ruse to equate uh, research subject and researcher, to strip them of social and economic tract trappings within a bounded contractual moment devoid of specificity. So SOAP is enlisted into a document-based ritual of verification, the document of course being signing um, or putting one's thumbprint on the consent form, that produces researchers and the researched as objectified, impersonal, and homogenous categories at the heart of our imaginings of ethics. While uh, anthropologists dem document how research transactions of blood, information, and benefits activate multiple gift economies that come into friction, SOAP, even as it is assigned competing meanings, works because its transaction is legitimated as ethical by both participants and researchers, and for the most part it is graciously received by participants. Indeed, as I talk a bit more about in the book, um, many people even went so far as to fake their identities to receive it, because of course these were random samples. So uh, if people knew SOAP was forthcoming, 
forthcoming, they would pose as, as someone else in some cases. Yet naming soap ethical does not pre preclude critical engagement with the ensuing production of value and knowledge from information collected. So even as soap appears to facilitate the collection of data and keep the gift relationship clean, it produces new kinds of subject positions, forms of value, and expectations in its transaction. Transactions in research worlds produce not only data, but new kinds of social bonds and social ruptures, and thus new kinds of social persons. So for some survey respondents, soap was a symbol of injustice and a metaphor for failures of the state and non-state administration of aid, resources, and gifts. The distribution of the seemingly innocuous soap gift sometimes engendered suspicion and distrust in sampled areas. Although, of course, soap is a standardized gift in that all who receive it receive it equally, it is interpreted as unjust because some people are left out. So the lopsided social terrain of lucky insiders and unlucky outsiders created by random sampling grafts onto a landscape pockmarked by other instances of uneven distribution. So people living in sample areas, for example, drew parallels between random sampling and exclusions produced by the government's annual distribution of limited fertilizer coupons to the poor, which was widely perceived to be inefficient, corrupt, and unfair. So one participant in LSAM's survey mobilized an aphorism to critique the pitfalls of randomization. Um, maze always goes to those who don't have teeth, or good things are wasted if given to the wrong people. While another wondered aloud why LSAM skipped some houses um, and went to others, others suggested that LSAM was interviewing the wrong people. If they wanted a good picture of Malawian life, they shouldn't be speaking to that fool over there. Um, in Malawi, a locally fitting gift, soap, meets formal ethical standards for any single research encounter, but it does not address expectations that a project should not skip houses, nor does it respond to critiques that individuals and communities are entitled to more than just soap. So survey participants explicitly coded research and soap as rights good citizens were entitled to, here using both the English and Chewa terms um, when talking about these entitlements. So some of my informants, for example, suggested it was their human right to receive health care or medicine um, if a project found them suffering. Uh, people would discuss how answering the survey question sometimes was sort of like opening a wound that they expected to then uh, be healed. Um, like fertilizer coupons distributed by the state, soap prompts reflection on the political relationship of citizens to institutions. Soap triggers its recipients to consider the value of information they surrender and complaints voice needs that might be fulfilled by one among the many projects Malawians often lump together. In terming SOAP a right, participants upend normative ethics based in liberal human rights and individualist personhood to resituate rights as material and often collective entitlements. SOAP makes the mismatch between interpretations of the value of research a problem for negotiation, even as it seeks to commensurate them as mere misunderstandings. So refusals to participate in surveys, which were actually quite, quite rare, and this was partly due to the labor of the uh, field workers who you know, uh, were taught in training sessions that, um, that refusals were, of course, very detrimental to, to the eventual data set. Um, so refusals were rare, but they, but they did happen. Um, and often symptoms of respondents' dissatisfaction with past research encounters with either this specific project or mostly in many cases with other projects interpreted broadly. So when I visited the household of a middle-aged man called Dominic who refused to participate in LSAM's survey, he explained his refusal. I won't answer their silly questions. People already came here a few months back, and some of my friends chose bottle caps with Kwacha, Malawi's currency, on them. And me, I chose a cap and it had nothing on it. If they're coming here to fool us again, tell them not even to come. In 2004, LSAM began HIV testing respondents in its panel survey sample. Because those who tested would need to report to portable tent test result centers two to four months after their initial test to receive the result, LSAM implemented an experiment to determine how small monetary incentives might affect respondents' likelihood of attending test centers. So the experimental design featured respondents drawing bottle caps marked with amounts ranging from about zero to three dollars from a bag or a hat and receiving a voucher to be redeemed upon pickup of results. In 2006, this incentive program was not implemented because of the advent and feasibility of rapid, test, rapid testing. However, that same year, LSAM initiated another incentives program, and here we see the palimpsest of various projects, this time an HIV prevention experiment. A portion of individuals who received an HIV HIV test in 2006, whether positive or negative, were enrolled in an incentive study whereby they participated in a similar bottle cap lottery that promised them the monetary amount depicted if they maintained their HIV status for the next year. 
In 2007, LSEM distributed the incentives, which ranged from zero to $32 at the time, based on what bottle cap a respondent had chosen back in 2006. Villagers interpreted this random distribution of incentives via a lottery system as unjust. Dominic, for example, felt fooled because he had not received what he felt entitled to, and feeling wronged motivated his decision to abstain from the 2008 survey, even though that survey had nothing to do uh, with incentives and featured sort of different um, data collection teams. Refusal to participate in research is likewise refusal to accept a gift of soap, yet these refusals, so long as they are not too numerous to reduce sample size significantly, may actually legitimate researchers' ethical claims by proving that potential subjects have agency to choose not to participate. Rather than viewing Dominic in his full personhood, LSAM encounters him as a depersonalized and categorical research participant whose refusal, in a sense, produce, reproduces a research community, or at least does not undo it. His refusal is not socially but numerically coded, easily digested by statistics that measure sample res retention or sample size or response rate. Dominic's critique that he did not receive the money he felt entitled to and the rationale underlying his refusal to accept the gift of soap and answer survey questions goes unaddressed <coughs> by research ethics that rely on those in the sample receiving soap and others outside the sample receiving nothing. Despite researchers' efforts to clearly explain study design, which they very much did, Dominic casts them as homogenous and an undifferentiated group of people who seek to fool him and others like him. Moreover, while demographers often blame interviewers, their appearance and mannerisms, for example, for refusals and non-response by respondents, Dominic indicates it is his interaction with a kind of corporate entity, the project, rather than one individual that mediates his refusal. Malawians often make little distinction between the many projects in their midst. So in 2000, for example, um, LSAM respondents perceived survey field workers as associated with the National Family Planning Program, uh, for example, inaccurately so. Um, and I should say, also, uh, people were very sort of able to often recite their research participant histories um, and often would show me sort of like piles of yellowing consent forms that they had uh, in, inside their homes. Um, while some researchers suggested that survey participation could be a way for participants to break up an otherwise interesting day, Participants often viewed research participation as a job, raising complaints about the value of soap in a discourse of labor, even as they continued to call it a gift. So many respondents complained they saw no profit in research participation. Um, a female LSAM participant called Grace suggested, I expect more than soap because it's not equivalent to the job I do as a respondent. It's a very big job. They can ask you so many questions on so many topics, and sometimes you just reach a point where you run out of answers and just look at the interview, interviewer. She's not paid for her time, but volunteer hears it ostensibly to benefit her larger community, yet even as research participants seem interchangeable from the perspective of projects fixated on sample size rather than individuals, people in sample areas indicated that research participants do good or bad jobs, different kinds of jobs, um, in explicitly framing participation as working or cuguira and chito, research subjects make political claims on projects tied up in a distributive economy of care and social welfare. SOAP, coded as an antonym of monetary payment, payment uh, in ethical jargon is re-signified as a commodity whose exchange value is inadequate remuneration for good work. Andrews, a long-term field worker, suggested research participants increasingly see research as a job. Um, quote, in Malawi, we have these rules that in research, you cannot give people money. But you know, times are changing. Nowadays, for you to get things you need, you need money. If somebody comes to your house and tells you, let's sit down and chat, that means you've lost that time. That could have been productive time, but you spent it chatting with someone. So people are really valuing their time. When someone gives them something, they can look at it and value it and say, okay, it's from this job that I've got this. He notes that participants carefully calibrate time and labor and contest the legitimacy of research rules, prescriptive ethics that name money as inappropriate gift for what he sees as a job. Field workers in general voiced concerns that project they worked for relied on gifts not to build, but to evade social obligations, consistent with Kingori and Madiga et al's findings that field staff of medical research projects in Kenya were wary of obligations that impoverished research subjects imposed on them as representatives of a wealthy foreign project. Um, um, and um, those, those studies indicate that um, some field workers and nurses actually um, would give their own money in some cases to research respondents whom they um, felt pity for. And, and I also observed that this would occasionally happen um, in the field. So these perspectives illustrate how a gift can be ethical when evaluated from a perspective within a research world, but unethical when evaluated in light of historical memory and experience in a particular time and place. Research participants also accuse Malawian fieldworkers of eating their money. 
they come here and instead of fetching food for the children, we sit here wasting time talking and talking. They go home and eat good food, rice and meat. They leave me hungry and make money as they do so. This accusation finds intertextual meaning in a history of eating money as critique leveled against elites, scammers, relatives, governments, or big men who fatten themselves on the spoils of the poor or gain wealth corruptly. While respondents answer questions for up to three hours, time is money or its equivalent in food, and longer form surveys may exacerbate participation, participants' frustrations with lost time. As participants experience what they see as a net loss, they witness interviewers, quote, getting fat from the information and of course the salary they collect. Some even accused interviewers of eating our money explicitly, invoking again the 2006 HIV prevention incentive experiment. The interviewers take the bottle caps with zeros on them and put them on the top of the pile in the bag. So we pick them and the people in t-shirts, the interviewers, eat our money. Indeed, it was common for respondents to furnish interviewers with small gifts during survey administration in line with local hospitality norms, sugarcane, ground nuts, fruits, or even a lunch of nsima, the staple dish in Malawi. Such gifts were given without ethical compulsion, but rather in the spirit of local hospitality, in contrast to the soap that flowed the other direction. So the soap gift aims to fast forward a social relationship that did not exist before the interviewer arrived at the household by making him seem trustworthy or kind, but frames this this relationship is ethical rather than social or economic. So for participants, projects were not only eating their time and leaving them hungry, but creating a new hunger for a better future they would likely uh, never taste. And I just want to note here, as I mentioned earlier, that most people, almost everyone, graciously received the soap, but it's nonetheless interesting that um, these complaints were rampant throughout, throughout the sample. So people were grateful, received the soap, and again, there were very few refusals um, in the samples. Um, the metaphor of eating also surfaced in accusations that research projects were sucking research participants' blood, um, using the, the Chewa term for bloodsuckers or something like vampires, Opopa uh, Magazi. Um, so these stories fit into a larger transhistorical genre, of course, that demonizes dangerous others, including colonial officials, researchers, politicians, and physicians uh, who steal or accumulate bodily material or information for mysterious ends. Um, and of course, Louis. White's work uh, treats treats these kind of rumors, as, as they're called often. Um, and in the Malawian context, uh, bloodsuckers appear very very much in the historical record. Um, Malawian nationalist uh, Chipenberry notoriously re referred to David Livingston as a bloodsucker. Um, and uh, sort of in the 1920s, um, allegations against British landlords um, for in, in the case of tenant farming um, indicated that they prowled estates to find uh, Africans to kill and eat. Um, um, and uh, of course, politicians are often accused of sucking blood. Um, so uh, again, these, these are not just limited to researchers, of course. Um, though previous studies of such vampire stories largely focus on blood stealing by medical institutions, stories in Malawi also place survey responses or information at the center of their accusations. Duonge, a recent participant in a survey, framed the information she surrendered to Elsam in bodily terms, quote, research is important. The findings can help improve our lives, but I I ask, why are the researchers stealing my voice? The soap gift is not equivalent to the voice she gives. For Chiwonge, soap may be ethical, but it is not enough. Soap for information, transactions, appear in project documents like proposals or in published findings as mere background or a shorthand reference for adherence to ethical guidelines. Yet, as we see, they play a crucial role in stabilizing and disrupting the socio-technical infrastructure in which data is made on the ground, even if these claims and complaints never actually um, attain the status of data themselves. They, they sort of happen in the margins um, of data production. Um, okay, and, and sort of my last empirical example before I conclude, um, I'll be talking a bit about, about beans, um, which I have here. Okay, um, distant from the eyes and ears of the demographers and economists who often design surveys, field workers grapple with human and non-human agents from the weather to respondents who lie to uh, that threaten <coughs> clean data. Fieldwork places a set of demands on perception, subjectivity, and performance that help materialize data. So in the book, I trace how researchers' scientific and aesthetic investments in pure, clean data, uh, symbolically represented in surveys that act as a recipe for data <coughs> collection, are made and unmade by practices and processes on the ground. So in addition to linguistic translation, and in Malawi, um, surveys were often translated into uh, three of Malawi's main uh, languages. Um, survey design and fine-tuning also necessitate 
paid attention to what might be termed accurate cultural translation. So uh, one section of LSAM's 25-page survey, which I reproduce here in English, uh, assessed respondents' subjective expectations of future outcomes like HIV infection, economic shocks, or illness. So researchers suggest that understanding these expectations is crucial to designing and evaluating policies in health, education, and so on. So in an attempt to ensure clarity of meaning of the abstract co uh, concept of probability as it's discussed in literature about this particular tool, for a low literacy sample of rural Malawians, um, the survey implemented an exercise that came to be known as Nyemba Nyemba, or beans reduplicated, among fieldwork teams and research participants. Respondents were asked to place a certain number of beans in a dish, much like we have here, um, to estimate how likely it was that they would, for instance, experience a food shortage or contract HIV AIDS. So one bean if it was unlikely to happen, and 10 if it was certain to happen. Um, and so for example, um, I think X2B here, pick the number of beans that reflects how likely you think it is that you are infected with HIV AIDS now. And then of course the, the interviewer would indicate the number of beans the person placed into the dish. So researchers largely consider the beans to be intuitive and engaging for respondents, and existing literature validates it as a tool that promises to increase the quality of data collected from an imagined villager, the low literacy research subject. And this is all premised on the idea that probability is too abstract a concept, that the visual and um, tactile aspects allow for probability to sort of make more sense in, in this context. Um, and also some of the validity is rooted in the fact that it has very um, high response rates that all respondents respond to, to the questions, okay, and that will, I think, sit with what I'm about to talk about. Um, respondents and field workers' responses to the beans uh, were largely negative. Uh, res research participants tended to view the beans as infantilizing. A common reaction was, if you want to play, go over there with the children. Um, <laughs> and the beans were a site of friction between actors across the different scales of the project. So fieldwork supervisors negotiated carefully between the top-down efforts to standardize the implementation of this activity. Their own skepticisms about the beans, um, the fact that many of the beans were constantly being lost, and complaints from field workers that the beans exercise was silly, time-consuming, and boring for respondents. So supervisors often chastised the interviewer, saying things like, quote, improve your attitudes. The bad morale among villagers is coming from you. These guys observe us. They can tell you think Nyemba Nyemba is worthless, and it allows them to protest against it. They occasionally spied on field workers as they interviewed respondents to ensure they were not cheating the project by failing to do Nyemba Nyemba, or uh, the most flagrant form of cooking data, just filling in numbers willy-nilly. However, at nightly meetings with American researchers, the supervisors suggested the beans exercise, which was deemed by demographers to be a culturally relevant instrument, was, quote, a misfit with Malawian culture. They observed that respondents pick the number you give as an example when demonstrating the exercise, among other things. So my field notes recorded at how households where Nyemba Nyemba was implemented highlight issues that arose when this tool was translated into the field and make clear that numbers recorded in the boxes are contingent and unsettled renderings of the realities they seek to enumerate. So Topeka, a 24-year-old uh, female interviewer, interviewed a 35-year-old man in a village in central Malawi. The pair and I sat behind his house on a mat he set out on the ground, and the survey interview proceeded smoothly until we reached the beans exercise. Although Josiah was initially a bit baffled by the instructions, um, asking, should I really move the beans around? Can't I just answer the questions? He was a relatively willing participant. Halfway through the long section, however, he grew tired and mentioned numbers without manipulating the beans in the dish. Topeka, frustrated, proceeded to pick up the number of beans he mentioned each time to put them in the dish, indicating he should continue to use the beans. Josiah grew increasingly annoyed, and the defeated Topeka completed the survey uh, section without the beans. So Topeka here felt compelled to perform the scripts and standardized implementation of the beans she had learned in training sessions, not least for the benefit of the anthropologist, who here becomes a potential surveiller uh, in her presence. Tabika's desire to be identified as a good field worker, trying to convince a difficult research subject to participate correctly in this activity, performs their absorption of the project's vision to collect accurate and reliable data. Captured in a phrase which was often repeated at trainings, um, you are the project. Yet her effort to translate the beans in a standard and normed fashion uh, intersected with contours of her unfolding social interaction with Josiah. 
The promise of the beans to collect high quality, more accurate information about rural Malawians' subjective expectations was in tension with the difficulties interviewers faced in implementing the exercise consistently. A close reading of Topika and Josiah's encounter, touching, manipulating, and debating the beans, exposes accurate data as inherently cooked. The numbers scrawled on the page and subsequently aggregated with those supplied by other respondents are provisional and improvised artifacts of social negotiations. Topeka, the reluctant bean counter in this scenario, makes every effort to ensure each bean is counted for the sake of data quality. The Nyambinyamba exercise to anthropologists and Topeka to outsiders may seem to resemble a divination session, throwing the bones or casting lots, more than a scientifically validated tool for collecting better data. Um, uh, indeed, demographers invested in this tool might do well to take up some of Varan's insights about numbers and counting across cultures. As she puts it, numbers are a ragged holdall for a multitudinous set of things done or performed differently in myriad times and places. But nonetheless, given all this, the beans work and are considered to work uh, in the demographic literature. So they make data and the frictions described here. Uh, they make sure they're excised from and never recorded onto the survey page. Okay, I realize my time's running out, so I'm just going to move to the conclusion. Um, so some of what I've presented today is is, uh, descriptive and I've sort of aimed to model what we might see if we track the social lives of data perhaps it is this kind of attention to the processes practices and political economies of data infrastructures that might understand might enhance our understanding um, big or small as material objects with histories uh, rather than free floating objective black boxes so data themselves might be recast as field sites amenable to cultural critique and ethnographic interpretation the practice of making data for all field workers including anthropologists relies on close closely managing relationships with people, things, and ideas in their midst. So it was through literally touching quantitative data, scrawling my initials on log forms like this one, marking surveys with red pens, packing cars with clipboards and boxes of soap, that I began to care about data. My time with survey projects made tangible the claims of science studies scholars that data, quantitative or ethnographic, do not exist independently of the ideas, technologies, people, and contexts that conceive of, produce, manage, and analyze them. So uh, a longtime Malawian supervisor on projects once told me, exasperation in his voice after a long day in the field, my life is data. His words are, have multiple valences that drive home the importance of anthropological study, not just of how numbers get things right or wrong, but what worlds, relations, and futures they might bring into being. So, thank you. Thank you Sorry, very much. It's a very stimulating talk um, and right on time. So we have lots of opportunity for questions. Uh, we have someone to pass the mic. Uh, and just to remind everyone here in uh, Eye on Africa, we are live streaming. So the mic is not an, a microphone for amplifying your voice. It's to be sure your voice is heard on the live stream for people who aren't in the room with us. So please do use the mic even if you have a loud voice. Yeah, what a fantastic paper. Thank you. I'm Mark Auslander, and most of my research has been just across the border in eastern Zambia. Mm -hmm. And and I was, as you were speaking, I mean, so much resonates, of course, mm -hmm. but I was interested in how you might expand a little bit the Levi-Straussian trope uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of cooking in, in, in reference, especially to the production of different formations of kinship that seem to be so clear here. Mm -hmm. Because I was certainly struck that, that it seemed that the the, the quote-unquote mis misreading of, of so much data collection projects as being part of the National Family Planning Survey uh -huh. was a kind of po mythopoetic condensation of the whole apparatus because so much of formal data collection, as we know, is about ripping uh, uh, communities out of the, kin the kinship and descent-based continua uh -huh. uh, of, of everyday life and, rent and producing them as these sort of na naturalized, individuated uh -huh. subjects, as you uh -huh. so brilliantly uh, showed us. Uh, and, and I mean, from the very first form that rips mm -hmm. people out of the general mm -hmm. natural and descent mm -hmm. uh, uh, right, forms of, of sort of material spiritual connectedness by asking mm -hmm. only who your father is as opposed to who your mother is, which would be much mm -hmm. more salient in these life worlds. Uh, so, but then it occurred to me that for all the clearly alienating aspects of these uh, operations, there's also a great deal of usefulness, mm -hmm. at least at the ritual level, to this aesthetics of, of counting. Mm -hmm. um, that's most obvious in mass witch finding. So what mm -hmm. mass witch finders do, who historically, mm -hmm. you know, from the 1920s onwards, come out of Nyasaland and move into mm -hmm. the rest of the Federation, uh, is, is that they produce human bodies uh, as the equivalent of those uh, 
uh, right, of those research data forms, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you, you make these little marks, you check things off, uh, mm -hmm. and you produce a sort of impermeable, uh, uh, individuated self uh, precisely by using all the technologies, the questioning, the en endless emphasis that witch finders always do on numerical, on, on, on redefining somebody out of the, the continuum of, of, of kinship and interdependent uh, 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 exchange systems to make them individuated sites of good or evil that can be measured on a spectrum. So mm -hmm. that's an extremely useful mm -hmm. social undertaking. So there's a utility. So even though we often sort of contrast, you know, in Chichewa, Chinyanja, mm -hmm. the concept of Kufotokoza to explain mm -hmm. in a sort of elder, you know, deep sort of heuristic, uh, hermeneutic as opposed to kurenga or counting, mm -hmm. actually there's something very socially useful, isn't there, mm -hmm. about these metaphors of, mm -hmm. uh, of counting? Yeah, yeah, um, thank you. I'd never thought about the connection to, to which finding, but it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think that what your question brings up, um, lots of really great stuff in there. Uh, is I think this question of cooking and, and the raw and the cooked um, as it, it plays into the story here, um, you know, something I've thought a lot about is I think the figure of the household, which becomes, you know, in the history of um, demography in particular, but um, other kinds of surveys, you know, and that's had a very fraught history that lots of demographers themselves have sort of pondered and, you know, how best to define a household, right? Um, which, which in and of itself, that being the singular kind of unit of knowledge production in this particular field, you know, is what allows for these inscriptions to be kind of detached from body and you know, in the colonial period, to link a, you know, a child on a baby, a baby on a mom's back into right British Empire or something like this, and um, you know, and into the present. And so I think that kind of nesting, which I think is a baked in or a, a built in form of cooking, like the assumptions around nesting, where you have relations between um, units and pluralities, um, and and the units and pluralities graft. Uh, somewhat awkwardly onto right existing kind of units and, and pluralities or particularly pluralities and so you know you have household um, compound you know all of these kind of assumed assumed nestings that I think um, are parts of what I would call kind of the the baked in kind of cooking that doesn't that isn't talked about nearly as much as the kinds of cooking that are more perhaps visible in the field like the flagrant just, forms yeah yeah, yeah. Well, so in that connection playing on this wonderful metaphor of divination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that the, 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 the distinction moving from the headman of the village to, mm -hmm. to the household or the compound, which is on the charts or mm -hmm. on the forms, is so beautifully in a ritual sense expressed by the, your goal. Mm -hmm. right? So that if, a, if, if a compound is defined as normally by researchers as those people who eat from the same bowl, mm -hmm. you're very much enacting that image of rurality by, through this enforcement mm -hmm. of, of, of placing the beans within the bowl, right? mm -hmm. which explains why there's such a, a profound resistance mm -hmm. by field workers who know better mm -hmm. to avoiding the beans and the bowls because you're enacting precisely the positioning of mm -hmm. uh, uh, of your research subject as a rural being mm -hmm. by doing this whole sort of bowl-centered eating thing. Right, right. Uh, so it's a very nice example of the ritual performance of the divinatory performance of, 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 of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, speaking of the beans and, and sort of, again, like the material histories of objects, I mean, soap being a really obvious one, but with the beans as well, thinking about sort of modes of early census type counting, um, you know, which often in Malawi had to do with like the, the onset of the hut tax and things like that, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it's, you know, sometimes sloppy to draw direct connections like that, but I think, you know, the sort of um, the memory of, of certain kinds of objects and so on, you know, might also play into like certain kinds of interpretations. Yeah, so I'm Laura Fair, and I have a couple, I mean, thank you very much for a really wonderful paper that, uh, yeah, I think makes a number of really important contributions, and I can't wait to go get the book out of the library and read it. Um, but I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is really just a clarification question. Mm -hmm. Did I understand correctly that this was part or connected to a larger project where people were tested for HIV and then mm -hmm. had to wait two to four months in order to get their results. 
Yeah. I mean, anybody that has ever tested for HIV knows those are the most painstaking days of your life. Mm -hmm. And that they expected people to wait that long for their results is just incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. But that's just a factual question or a clarification mm -hmm. question. And then my, my real question is about the feedback loop. Mm -hmm. I think you revealed a number of really critically important insights into some of the problems mm -hmm. with these um, surveys. And I'm wondering how the feedback, how, how, how your research has been received mm -hmm. by the people who are actually mm -hmm. constructing and administering these mm -hmm. surveys, and if there has been any real effort to address some of the important issues that you raise. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm I'm about to field a survey in Malawi in a couple of months, oh, so awesome. it was really uh, <laughs> yeah, useful yeah. to hear what you had to say. Um, uh, and I'm kind of approaching this very much from from the perspective of, mm -hmm. a, of a quantitative social mm -hmm. scientist. And I, there's there's some um, there's some new research coming out, and particularly in political science, kind of thinking about these social interactions and how they might actually affect the kind of data that mm -hmm. we have. There was a, a paper that came out recently in one of the bigger journals about uh, co-ethnicity mm -hmm. and uh, survey responses. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a, a paper recently on, on age differences mm -hmm. and, and survey responses. Mm -hmm. And the way that most of this research tend to treat these social interactions is that they kind of estimate, uh, quote unquote, kind of the, the real value in uh, those interactions where you have co-ethnics uh, co or mm -hmm. where you have a small difference in terms of, uh, of age. Um, I would be curious to kind of think uh, if you could comment a little bit on uh, how do you think about those kind of, right. uh, of issues? Mm -hmm. uh, is there certain kind of social interactions that would be more conducive to, to more kind of neutral uh, measuring of data? Mm -hmm. Take one more and then we can. Okay. Uh, my name is Hope. I'm from Malawi. Oh. Yeah, I'm a PhD student here. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, if I saw like your slides, collector, you did mm -hmm. your studies uh, in central Malawi, right? Um, so I spent time in southern and central Malawi for all of the projects. I wasn't working in the north, yeah. Oh, okay. So. My understanding is that, like, within the three regions, people have different mm -hmm. kind of cultures, and I mean, like, mm -hmm. uh, is there any way that you used, like, to find out whether, like, the, the challenges that we are facing were, like, common across all these cultures? Mm -hmm. And also, like, uh, in terms of HIV testing, like, I understand it's a sensitive issue, and uh, mm -hmm. mostly, like, to get people willing, like, to to get tested, like, mm -hmm. it's a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't want, like, to get tested, and they feel like maybe people review their status. Like, I mean, how willing were participants to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, OK, so the, the first question was about the HIV testing. So that was sort of prior to the streamlining and onset of rapid testing. And yeah, so it was, so now they, they do rapid test kits and you, know, you receive your results uh, immediately. And sort of tying in with that, um, you know, it, again, I, your point about it being a sensitive issue and certainly there's tons of sort of ethical confidentiality trainings and, and modes built into this process of HIV testing in particular. Um, so the projects since I worked with them have also started doing like certain kinds of um, biomarkers testing as well, um, which which is is interesting. But you know, anytime you have blood or tissue, it becomes perhaps a bit more fraught than uh, just, just answering questions. Um, and I think it, it really depended. So some people were very willing to test and actually, you know, I think we have this sense that people are very sensitive about surrendering blood, and blood, of course, carries like certain kinds of, of meanings uh, across you know, different meanings, different contexts. Um, but you know, some some folks were really 
uh, viewed getting the HIV test as, as a benefit, um, and, and others did not. Um, in terms of uh, you know your point about working across cultures, uh, it's a very interesting one, and it played into um, the hiring processes for the projects in particular. So um, you know there were certain stereotypes about ethnic groups that came up in the context of attempting to hire or administer the survey, and some had practical effects as well. So it was in particular difficult to find um, Yao interviewers um, who were sort of educated enough to administer the survey, um, and this also came up in the hiring practices where often Malawian uh, field workers, um, so say many of whom were Tumbuka, would be hiring and have certain assumptions about Yao people um, being slower or more less in interested in education. Um, and in general, there were assumptions that Yao interviewers were the worst surveyors, um, which really weren't borne out in, in practice. But uh, those kinds of stereotypes, you know, also uh, for sure. So the bloodsuckers rumors, as you might uh, be aware, mostly were in Chiard Zulu, were, were more rampant in, in southern Malawi. And again, that sort of like reaffirmed people's ideas that the North is more highly educated and people were easier to work with in the North. So actually the, the least um, favorite site, again, and this is all sort of um, as told among field workers, was uh, Balaka and among among the Yao. They were considered to be the most like difficult respondents, playing on, I think, like long-standing stereotypes in the sort of national um, imagination. Um, and. And I guess this sort of ties in with the question of interviewer effects that you were you were asking. Um, what's really interesting is, um, you know, as as you're probably aware, um, some of these projects like have uh, what they they kind of have built-in checks and balances to to determine and ascertain like the validity and to determine the extent of interviewer effects. So with this project, the last page of the survey was actually something that interviewers would fill out themselves and. Um, it sort of it, it had certain kinds of like red herring questions, I guess. So well, the main one being during the survey at one point you'd ask, "Do you have a pit latrine?" And it was a question that seemed simple, but some people would, um, you know, say an answer that wasn't necessarily accurate either to claim that they did have one, um, you know, to sort of seem uh, better, wealthier than they might have been. Um, so that question on the final page, the interviewers were told, "Okay, make sure you ask to use uh, the latrine so that you can ascertain." Whether whether or not that person responded correctly back on page whatever. So uh, that page also had some interesting other questions built in. They were often about like attractiveness because it's also a question as to whether attractiveness of an interviewer might affect the responses. Um, and so uh, interviewers were asked uh, ahead of field work to like rank their co-interviewers um, on attractiveness. So it really, I mean, demographers like they build into the the system very. Um, you know, intense procedures for attempting to measure these things. Um, you know, uh, Kim Yidian, I think you probably know her work, um, has written about, particularly about co-ethnics um, in, in the context of Malawi. So, you know, I think she sort of, um, she sort of uh, finds, you know, um, some, some stuff around, uh, this is, you know, an overblown discourse in some regard, but it, it really depends. And in my experience, like I was on the ground and so I haven't systematically studied this, but I think there were assumptions, particularly on the part of the demographers that these would be huge factors. That like if a woman was interviewing a man or a man was interviewing a man or if a um, Tumbuka was interviewing um, a Chewa or whatever it might be. And I really, it just struck me that it was very individual. So it was more almost personality. Some people were shy. Some people were really outgoing. Some people loved to tell stories. Some people didn't. Um, and I think, um, you know, one thing was hearing how the interviewers commented on like the processes as they were happening. So, you know, they would find, you know, it was assumed that people would like minimize, for example, in response to the question, how many sexual partners have you had? Um, you know, and I mean, or how many times have you had sex in the past month? All sorts of questions like that. It was assumed people would minimize in the case of sexual partners. But, you know, it was interesting to hear um, the commentary after the fact. Someone would say, oh, I just had a respondent that said they had, you know, 25 sexual partners, haha, ha, like, yeah, right, you know, and that was usually men. So there was sort of um, an informal like commentary on some of these points. Um, and so certainly, you know, of course, gender affects things, but, but I don't know if it's as in systematic. Like my sense was it, it almost had more to do with individual encounters and with the way someone was feeling that day or um, the rapport that someone was able to build. So actually the interviewers, I think, who got the, the best data just were good interviewers. <laughs> like they were 
great at creating rapport or being friendly or you know those kind of things. I think that stood in as perhaps more important than some of these other measurable like interview effects. But um, but yeah, I think Kim would be a fantastic person to talk to if you know her. I can give you her, her contact. Um, and in terms of feedback loop, um, yeah. So uh, what's interesting about my book is that for anyone who's like a demographer or who has done this kind of work, like they're not really surprised by any of this. Um, and like I think what I what I'm my, the audience for my book is is certainly people who administer surveys. So that, what I want them to take from the book is really that. Um, this process of, of counting and data collection, um, it does a lot of other stuff in the meantime. So it's not necessarily about is your data good or bad, but you know how, how can the entire apparatus of global health and research in Africa, right, think about some of these questions, particularly around ethics. Like we have this individualist concept of ethics and informed consent, but you know, how do we seriously take seriously those questions around histories of you know, exploitation and extraction and you know, what, what might that actually look like? And I think that's a, a really hard question. Or you know, how, how can we learn from um, some of the stories of, of field workers who've managed to sort of attain some measure of social mobility through working in research worlds and sort of systematize that and make you know, the research endeavor perhaps a bit more um, you know, open to situations like that one where, you know, and, and certainly the projects I work with have actually very much done that, like in the intervening years. Um, many of the field workers are now uh, working at consulting firms in, in Malawi, um, you know, with research projects. Some of them are, are now um, co-authors on, on some papers and things like that. So, you know, but that's not really the norm. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that does happen. Um, but yeah, I get a lot of email. I've actually gotten a lot of emails from people, like, I don't know how they find my book, but like at the World Bank and stuff like that. And um, they they mostly say you know yes this describes my experience like perfectly um, and it was like so interesting to read um, but I think the other audience for my book is really just people um, I think it's a case of thinking about data in a more critical way and like whatever kind of data you're you're working with um, you know because demographers actually they do profoundly understand the uncertainty in data and that's why they do so much to manage it um, but they prefigure what they're going to see. Um, and so in a way, they're well aware of a lot of these things and really try to manage them. But I think that people who um, you know, are, are consumed by the discourse of data or think of data as this, this wonderful thing, um, and you know, I think about this with the neoliberalization of the university, for example, um, and oh, God, uh, that's a side story, but um, which I won't say because this is live streaming, but, um, <laughs> but you know, like thinking about surveys, right, and how they're constructed, and I'm sure some of us have taken surveys in our, in our institutional context, and you know, uh, it struck me in experiences like that one, like how little my colleagues and people um, who are all very critical, um, you know, think about questions like this and what it means um, to sit there in front of a question, what it means to ask a question in a certain way, what it means, um, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, how an adjunct faculty member might respond to a question versus a tenure track faculty. Like all of these questions that I think are like in resonance with my book, but like even though it's a really different context. but. But yeah, demographers, um, you know, and and I presented this work um, at the University of Malawi, and uh, of course, many of it was funny. So some of the field workers. Um, had managed to go on and, and um, attend the university, or uh, and you know some of them were there, and they they you know so it was more like a nostalgic trip of sorts. Um, but they they said, yeah, we remember that, you know. We, so um, so in a way, it, it, they see it more as descriptive, like yeah, that that resonates. Um, but I think there's some bigger questions uh, about about you know addressing some of the um, the more problematic things that I should note are no way in no way. Um, you know, singular to these these projects, um, but are you know sort of rampant in the entire apparatus of um, you know global health research going back to international health research going back to tropical medicine. I mean, all of these things have been pretty consistent. Like if you read surveys, like the, the Nyasaland Nutrition Survey from the 1930s, mm -hmm. I I looked a lot at that in the in the archive and. You know, it was it was so interesting to see uh, the the discourses and the resonances um, that that were consistent, like since that time period with data collection. So, I think we have time for two more questions. Are there two questions? And I have one. And I'm I'm noticing that some people are leaving already. So if you're on your way out, please make sure you sign in uh, over here. If we have the book here, but yeah. 
Thanks for an interesting presentation. I enjoyed reading your book and, and your articles. Um, I have a question for you about your participant observation mm -hmm. in the process, because you showed that image of where your initials mm -hmm. uh, were clearly visible uh, in one of the interview forms. And now here you're giving this wonderful sort of detached you know, academic scholarly mm -hmm. presentation to us as an analyst and making us think of all these, of the social life of numbers. Um, but what about your active role in the field? Mm -hmm. What about your role in the cooking data? Mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us? What can you tell yeah, us yeah. about that? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'll just ask ask a question then. So I'm I'm really interested in the selling of the data, the marketing of data, and mm -hmm. I happen to have worked for almost 20 years in a place that has something called a DSS, which is a demographic survey instrument. And it's actually sold to researchers. So you can go to the, those researchers and say, I need children from age 6 to 12 that um, I can study for a longitudinal study of mm -hmm. six years that have single moms. And that database will tell you which households in that area meet your classifications, and you buy that. Mm -hmm. And it raises issues. I, I want to I wanna do is tie that into data privacy, because mm -hmm. you claimed that mm -hmm your knowledge of data might help us understand big data. Mm -hmm. And is there a different regime of data privacy in the world you work in compared to like the Facebook thing? Or mm -hmm. are there connections? Because it seems to go back to people making money from other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I just wondered if you could say something bigger about that maybe in closing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so my role in cooking data, yeah, certainly. So, um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think for, for medical anthropologists and for those of us anthropologists who particularly work in the realm of what is glossed as critical global health studies, um, you know, increasingly in the past, I guess, about decade or decade and a half, um, you know, it's become clear that in order to do this kind of work, you, you're increasingly embedded in these kinds of um, institutional contexts. And this, this has largely, you know, this has often been the case for um, if we think about the critiques of colonial anthropology and so on. But, um, but I think what's different about it is, yeah, I mean, I took up a place on an assembly line. Like my new project is uh, working with, um, a, a sexual minority rights organization in the capital of Malawi, um, and there as well, I'm, I'm really embedded and, and part of you know even as I'm thinking critically about paperwork and about metrics and about indicators, I'm I'm part of you know person producing that knowledge. Um, so my role in cooking data, I really did, I found it important to um, very much participate in all aspects of this, and um, I think that you know that really afforded me um, a, a sort of you know kind of unique view because as I was participating, I also was afforded the privilege to take a more distant stance. So I was not like the other field workers. I was kind of an honorary field worker. Um, my livelihood was not tied up in this. Um, and also uh, sort of, you know, I think I was subject in many ways to some of the same um, standards and assumptions that guided the collection of quantitative health data. So I'll give one example. Um, first of all, I, I, I would often stay behind after projects left, and I, would, um, I wanted to interview people who had just recently been surveyed, sort of to ask them about their experience participating in surveys. Um, and that was an interesting experience because for one of the projects, they they handed me a, a random sample of households in their random sample um, so that I was then um, meant to go to these specific households and that was in the interest of me as the anthropologist going to talk to people after the fact, not like dirtying the data. Um, and you know, so it would be randomly distributed who I would visit. I also uh, wanted to, to give different kinds of gifts than, than soap um, and they suggested that I I not do so. Um, so here I was giving the same soap uh, as, as people were kind of narrating to me their grievances about, about soap. Um, so, you know, in terms of cooking data, I was, I was also like baked into the project, I guess. Um, but, you know, I think for me it was, 
it was an experience that I, I really appreciate. And, I, and like I sort of mentioned briefly at the end of the talk, I, I really came to care for data as these like lively things that require so much sort of loving care in a way that made me think about the, um, the anthropological endeavor as, as well. And you know, as, as anthropologists know, um, or I guess one of our secrets is that actually interviews are, are not at all like the most useful information. And I think that has a lot to do with um, these questions around cooking or interviewer effects, for example. Um, you know, the sort of, of course, building rapport and all these things, but for me, I've always found, in, in, since being an anthropologist, that um, the most useful information is that in the doing um, and, you know, viewing my own interviews as these kind of like situated, uh, contingent, kind of problematic, um, in many ways, uh, artifacts of, of social interactions between very different people. Um, you know, uh, all of those things became like more acute to me. And I think that anthropology has uh, retained perhaps too much this, this necessary compulsion to have this like detached, critical bird's eye view. Um, and I think that all of us who actually work in these contexts are, are actually quite aware that critique is, is necessarily also like complicity in some ways. And um, so, you know, I sort of, I guess that's how I would answer your question. Um, the question about data privacy, um, so that's something I'm beginning to think about with a, a side project I'm working on, which is on sort of, um, uh, it's, it's actually on a, a boutique fitness chain called Orange Theory Fitness, which is a technology tracked um, sort of fitness experience uh, that, I, that I indeed participate in and, and it has a heart rate monitor and um, any other fans in the room. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I'm thinking a lot, I've been reading a lot about like the fitness boom. I've been reading a lot about like other kinds of data and, and a little bit about social media and stuff like that. Um, I don't think I can speak to that completely uh, knowledgeably, but um, I think what, some of what you said resonates with Adriana Petrina's work on experimentality and like contract research firms and, you know, uh, also the way in which research is now kind of covering the globe in a way that, you know, especially in the case of biomedical research, you know, running out of, right, pure populations. So if you're testing or doing clinical trials, you know, um, you know, the U.S. by now is such a sullied population because it's so full of pharmaceuticals, right? So if you're, you know, looking for other kind of, you know, uh, frontiers, right, of, of biomedical research, she talks a bit about that. Um, but in terms of privacy, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, how do we scale up, you know, the sort of what we're familiar with, which, you know, even if there are imperfections in it, the sort of, you know, uh, ethical research standards that we've had since the Belmont report and all, you know, that are very much um, standardized into this kind of research with the consent form and confidentiality procedures and reporting adverse effects and all of that. Um, yeah, you know, I think that, um, that that question of what do we do, even when we shift, say, from paper and, pe paper and pencil surveys, which in some ways I think are easier to like manage um, in terms of these kinds of questions, than uh, say, you know, now if we're using smartphones or iPads to collect this same kind of data in these contexts, you know, even that simple shift when we involve technology, you know, I mean, pencil and paper is a technology, but that kind of technology. Um, but yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't think I can speak much to the question of big data. It's something I think I'm thinking a lot about and in thinking about how to translate this kind of work on small data into bigger data. And I think privacy is one of those components, but I want to think a little more about it. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everyone, for your wonderful questions. Great discussion. Um, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. And please uh, just want, let me just give you a couple of announcements. Next week, our Eye on Africa speaker is Esperance uh, Kashala Abadnez. She's coming to us uh, as an associate professor from the University of Bergen. She's been working on one of our AAP-funded projects on health. Uh, it is a health uh, survey-based project uh, working on Konzo degree di disease in the Democra uh, Democratic Republic of Congo called Global Health Alliances Across Nations. I'd also like to just announce that Thursday, February 21st from 6 to 8, there will be um, a special program uh, called Bridging the Gap, Understanding and Remedying Schisms Between African and African American Students. Um, and so uh, actually one of the organizers, Shingi Mavima, is right here. That'll be here in the International Center in room 303. 
So thanks again, everyone, for coming. And uh, thank you so much, Paul, for a yeah, very stimulating presentation. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs>